Yeah, hi everybody. We're onto the proper graveyard shift now, aren't we? It's, <laughs> going, it's going dark outside. Uh, I hope you can see okay and the light's not getting anywhere, but I, I, I want you to be able to see me. Um, I'm going to give a, a bit of a talk about measure, measuring integrity. Um, the, uh, the title up there is a little misleading, just to, just to tease, but basically um, measuring things is really important in this industry. Um, it's fair to say, and it's, 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 it's pretty much a given, that if something improves a business or something, by doing it a different way, reduces the profitability of a business, that thing must be measurable. If you can't measure it, then it's not actually going to be, it can't be making a difference. Hope that makes sense. Um, integrity is, is one of these things. Um, we must be able to measure integrity and I think we, we, we don't do a very good job of measuring integrity or integrity effort and that's what I'm challenging with you today. Um, let's start with something that everybody, everybody in this industry cares about, which is money. Um, how many of you, and it's a rhetorical question but you can, you can cheer if you want, how many of you think we should be spending more money on integrity? No. How many of you think we should be spending less? Or how many of you would like to spend less? How many of you don't really know whether you should be spending more money or not? And that's maybe not the best way to find out whether you're spending enough or not. Um, I think the question's a, a bit of a trick question in itself because how do you measure integrity? Doesn't, it's not very clear what it means anyway. So let's think of different ways that you can measure, measure integrity. Maybe money is a good way. But how do you decide how much to spend or how not to spend? We've already opened with that. It's, it's a tricky one. Um, can you measure integrity by failures or anomalies or, or condition? Has your integrity failed if you've had more than 10 anomalies in the last month? Or how, it's, it, we all use anomalies to measure integrity success. But how do we, how do we set it? How do we, how do we turn that into an indicator, a KPI? We all love KPIs as well, don't we? Um, production, maybe uptime is a way that we can measure our integrity success. But again, do you set it at 97%, 95%, 60%, 70%? It's great saying it's a good indicator, but where do you set it? And if you can't set it, is it the right thing to measure? The law, well, a lot of us use the law. Um, when I say the law, I mean how many, how many HSE concern letters do you get, or how many improvement notices, or how many times have you had a prohibition notice in the last two years? This is not maybe the best measure either, but these are all things that we use. And finally, uh, trying hard. A lot of us think that just by doing more inspection or more RBIs or doing more stuff, that's a good way of measuring our integrity. So we've got all these options. And as I say, we love KPIs, but by using these, these things, and we, we use all of these, what are we trying to optimise? What is it that we're trying to do? Um, quick step back now. Some of you may have seen this. It came out about two weeks ago from Step Change. It's the Hydrocarbon Release Prevention Guidance Document. Um, it's been put together by some of the greatest minds in the industry from um, a lot of the major operators, from Wood Group, uh, other engineering companies. A lot of people have put a lot of effort into this document and it's a really good document, don't, don't get me wrong, but this is, this is current state of the art, how to manage hydrocarbon releases, how to reduce hydrocarbon releases. And it's got sections on operational, integ uh, operational um, integrity, it's got sections on um, general integrity management, it's got sections on competence, it's got sections on learning, and each section, and they made it very clear when they were rolling it out, each section has a subsection on measurables. The idea is that these are metrics that you can use in order to assess how well you're doing at any particular section. So the uh, integrity management section has a list. The list's there on that page. This is just half of it, but it's representative of of, of the rest of the rest of the metrics and all I want you to notice don't worry about the words number of number of number of number of we're counting things it's like counting how much money we're spending measuring our uptime these are these are fixed numbers that we're counting and 
great document, really useful, and I recommend you download it from the website, but I think we're still missing the point by counting things. Um, no good me just saying that, I have to give you an alternative, don't I? So uh, there's this guy, Charles Kettering, rather famous chap, 200 to 300, I think he had 300 patents to his name when he finally died, a Scottish chap who uh, invented the uh, fuel injector. And he said, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. And that's something that I, I really like the idea of. If you can actually state what the problem is, you're probably halfway to getting an answer. And so what I'm going to try and do is state the question. Um, before I start that, I just want to make a de define a term because it's not clear what it is and you need it for later on. Integrity management effort. This is the work of doing integrity management. If you double the amount of stuff you do, that increases your integrity management effort for the same quality of task. If you do a higher quality of task for the same amount, that increases your integrity management effort. That's all you need to know. That's what I mean when I'm talking about integrity management effort. So we move on to this. The idea here is time along the bottom and plant condition at the, on the left. If your condition's good, nothing goes wrong with time. If your condition's poor, things go wrong. That's where you want to be probably, just above the red line, because you don't want to be spending too much, but you don't want things to go wrong. So in a perfect world, that's probably where you'd aim to be. But it's not that simple, because that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about levels of compliance above the line, where nothing goes wrong, but then if you spend even more, if your condition's even better, you've got shiny, pa pa shiny paint. It's like when the Queen's just visited and everything still smells of fresh paint. So you're spending way too much for, for a fit-for-purpose system. Similarly, I've worked with organisations who are quite happy to be in the HSE's bad books as long as there's no improvement notices. They don't really want to be in the nothing goes wrong. They're happy to let things go wrong, have a few water leaks from their uh, produced water system spraying over the deck, as long as it's just a letter from the HSE and it's not an improvement notice they get. And where you want to be here, probably, might be somewhere like that. I show it as going up and down because that's how we, that's how we work. Nothing goes wrong. Oh, it's gone. Oh, let's do something. And you get this sort of, this sort of cycling. That's where you don't want to be. So the first picture I showed had a nice straight line. I've now brought in this oscillation. And I want to explain where I believe that comes from. We've got another graph here. Um, this is where integrity effort comes in. Integrity effort is shown in blue, and condition is shown in black. If we start at the left, we've got a nice stable plant, just where we want it, condition stable, and the integrity manager says, everything's fine, why are we spending so much on integrity? Shouldn't we be spending a bit less? So you reduce the amount of spend on integrity, and nothing happens, because it takes a while for that reduction in spend to feed through the condition stays good. And then eventually, the condition begins to deteriorate. But you think, oh, it's just unlucky. We'll be fine. Let's, let's just leave the integrity effort where we are. Condition continues to come down. You start to panic. You start getting improvement notices. You start putting more integrity effort in. And you overshoot. And because of the delays between, um, between the condition deteriorating and you realizing that it's happened and the time between you doing something and the condition improving, you end up cycling. You end up with a cycle like this. And I, I was thinking, remember what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to redefine my question. I'm trying to, the, what's the question? What's the question? So this bounced into my head. I'm a physicist by trade. And I thought, and I, I, my brain works by matching ideas. So I thought, oh, foxes and hares, I remember that. Foxes and rabbits, population dynamics. I did that in, at school where the population of rabbits builds up because they breed like rabbits. And then all of a sudden the foxes go, oh, there's loads of rabbits, so the population of foxes comes up. But it takes a while, because it takes a while for a baby fox to be born and grow to maturity. By the time there's more foxes, you've got so many rabbits, the foxes overshoot and you end up with this cycling again. So this is what you end up with, which is directly analogous, I would put it to you, 
to the relationship between integrity effort and condition. We always put the, put the effort in too late because we wait for the condition to drop. Then as the condition comes back up, we can carry on putting the effort in and the condition's coming up at top speed, but we're still putting the effort in and we don't actually stop putting the effort in until the, it's, oh, it all goes horribly wrong. What I'm saying is it's out of kilter and it's not efficient. The most efficient way to manage these things is about having really fast feedback loops. And we don't have those because we get regulatory concerns. We get the HSE saying, oh, we're a bit concerned about this, but that doesn't improve the condition because there's a lag. It takes ages for that. Even though it, it really upsets you and you get wound up and everyone runs around, that doesn't fix the anomalies. That doesn't stop, that doesn't stop the plant from corroding. Mm. Plant condition, you have anomalies. You detect an anomaly. Detecting an anomaly doesn't improve the condition. There's a lag. Even integrity initiatives, more inspection. Inspection doesn't stop corrosion. All these feedback metrics which we use, regulatory concerns, plant condition, integrity initiatives, they're all too slow. And they're all the things that we should be measuring to manage our integrity management according to the latest, uh, the latest um, documents. So we're here. We're looking the wrong way, in my view. The nice ideas, we do them. I'm not saying we shouldn't count them. It's important to know how many anomalies you've got. It's important to know how many inspections you're doing. But are they helping us to control the condition efficiently? So it's a bit of a model, a little simple model here. What I'm suggesting is that we, we measure condition, anomalies, plant condition. It takes a while for that condition to be turned into an integrity concern. Someone needs to get the inspection report and acknowledge it. It then takes a while for the integrity effort to actually be put in place, whether that's inspection or repair, and then it takes a while for that integrity effort to have an effect on the condition. But it's not that simple, because every now and then, because we're cycling, the condition goes extra bad and we have a failure. And all of a sudden, if you have a failure, that's more important, so you get more of a accelerated feedback loop but it's not that simple because you've got the HSE as well and all the regulators so as soon as you have a failure they get involved and everyone's running around like numpties and it's not even that simple because over the last while we've had the oil price issues so the oil price drops what happens no one wants to spend any money on inspection but the oil price comes back up oh we don't want to shut down to inspect because because the oil price is back up so that's where we are. So what, what, what can we do? You're probably expecting me, being a, a techno, to say, let's build a dynamic simulation of effort and condition and analyze it to see how we, no, forget that, that's nonsense. Just address the lags. Where are the lags? How do we address these lags? That's, that's what the problem is. And are we the first to think of this? Well, no, we're not. Because the NHS have got an excellent set of um, KPIs for accident and emergency. You'll have heard all about them. It includes the four and a half hour waiting time. This is where they are. They have five accident and emergency indicators. Time to initial assessment. Time to treatment. Total time in A&E. Then they have two, four and five, which are based on rates, how fast you do things. They don't ask how many patients they treat. They don't ask how many stitches they put in. They don't ask how many x-rays are done. You could almost draw an analogy between the time to initial assessment, which is how long is it between doing the inspection and doing the RBI. Time to treatment, how long between doing the RBI and actually understanding things and creating some sort of intervention. So let's have a look at our model. Let's look at the bit we can manage, the bit that we've got control over. Forget all the other bits. They only come in when this one goes wrong. If we, can, if we can control this, we're in a good place. So we have the first lag. This is the lag between actually the condition deteriorating and maybe we get an anomaly or some corrosion and actually um, acknowledging it. Effectively, this is the inspection, the inspection cycle. What we need to do here is we need to have empowered, competent inspection engineers 
who are able to make decisions. It's all been talked about today already. I'm just repeating now. I'm repeating what was spoken by, uh, by Stevie and uh, Fraser. Competent, empowered inspection engineers who can make decisions, who write quality inspection reports that don't have to be re-inspected. You don't want to have to re-inspect, re-inspect, re-inspect. Let's get it right first time. Inspect once well. Lag two. This is after the RBI when you're deciding what to do. What we need to do is we need to have really, really competent, empowered integrity engineers who can do this, who can actually turn an inspection report, which they don't have to send back to the inspection engineer because it was done right in the first place, to get re-inspected. It's good already. Keep the quality. Do a good analysis. Do a proper condition analysis. Let's, let's make sure it's quality all the way. All the quality means that you don't have to have feedback loops. It's no good, it's no good. You can reduce the chain of command. You want to cut back on chain of command. You want the inspection engineer to be empowered to do his bit, the integrity engineer to be empowered to do his bit. Then you've got lag three. Uh, I was speaking to, to Andrew just in the break. Integrity effort. Integrity effort can be inspection. I'm not saying don't do inspections, but in inspections don't change the condition. Inspections don't reduce, don't reduce um, corrosion. What does is um, corrosion inhibitor, repairs, all those sort of things. So what we're trying to do is take all the lags out of this circuit and then what we're left with, in summary of what I've just said, is six points, I would suggest. Let's think about the time between the inspection, the reporting of the inspection, and the RBI. Let's get that down. Let's, let's put a KPI on that. Analysis time. Let's make sure that we don't have inspection reports sitting on shelves for years. Take immediate action. Empower the inspection engineers, the inspection technicians, to actually put on holding coats. Let's, let's get them to do something at the time. Give them the, give them the, the knowledge and the ability to do that and trust them. Um, so the top three are all about reducing the lags, but so are the bottom ones. The quality of reporting is key to not having to re-report, not having to re-inspect. Empowerment, I've said, I've said the word enough. Unnecessary inspections, finally. We've talked about carrying, reduce the number of unnecessary inspections. We've got more time to do necessary inspections, but we've also got more time to do everything else. It all points to reducing the delays and the lags in the system, in the feedbacks. So that was six points. I've brought it down to one sound bite, which is don't count events, concentrate on delays. And I'll leave you with that. That's great. Thank you, Martin.